morning, everyone. Welcome. Hello, everyone. And if you guys didn't see my message when Hello. you were in the waiting room, if you can change your display name to the one that's underneath your picture, if you can change that to be your name, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Do you want me to put in my last name? You do not need to put in your last name, thank you. Just your first name is fine. Hi, Charlie. Hello, friend. Oh, hi, Victoria. Hi. You don't have to. Oh, the second time I've seen you all summer? <laughs> yeah. So how have you been? I've been pretty good. How was your summer? It was good. Good. And then I also just put a welcome question into the chat. So if everybody can answer this in the chat, that would be awesome. Always we want to know what your first name is, where you're from. You can put your city or your city and your state, um, your Girl Scout level. So are you a Daisy, a Brownie, a Junior, et cetera. And what is your favorite animal? Do you have a question, Riley? Okay, thank you. Oh, hey, this is just a good one. Oh, we've got somebody from Connecticut. I was telling, um, so if you guys don't know me, my name is Charlie, and I'm the camp director for the Girls' Fest New Mexico Trails, and Charlotte is going to be our lead park ranger today, and I was telling her earlier where some of our out-of-state girls are from. So we've got a Connecticut, we've got Massachusetts. Awesome. We've got lots, of lots of people from New Mexico, Los Alamos, Albuquerque. Ooh, very nice. New Jersey. We'll give hey, Charlie? Yes, ma'am. Is it okay if I put the first initials for it? Yeah. Okay. Albuquerque. Illinois. Nice. Wow. Snow leopards. Ooh. And I'm a second year junior. I'm just going to put junior. Actually, I'll put second year. That's close enough. For now. This weekend in our backyard, they ate our weeds. I had somebody stuck in the waiting room. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, they're in now. Okay, so anybody who is just joining us, um, we do have a welcome question. That was the norms, so that's not the welcome question. Just copy pasting the wrong thing. So if you can, in the chat, go ahead and answer, what is your name, where are you from, your city and state, or just your city, and your Girl Scout level and your favorite animal. And we're gonna be giving everybody about, probably just a minute or so more just to get into the room and get connected. Because you guys can still type into the chat and answer the question and stuff as we're going through the program. Um, hey, Hi, Illuminata. And while we are answering the question, I'm just going to quickly go over a couple of our rules. So we did send these to your parents, and hopefully you guys got to look at them before. And you've all been on a lot of Zooms so far this summer. Um, and if this is your first one, welcome to your first one. 
Um, but just remember that if you have a question for this event, so for this program, you're gonna type your question into the chat um, instead of raising your hand or unmuting yourself. So if you have a question, definitely type it into the chat. You can answer questions in the chat. If you cannot type and you don't have somebody with you to help you, let us know by giving us, you know, the little raise hand or to like actually raise your hand. We can only see so many videos on the screen at once. So I might not be able to see all of your video screens to see your raised hands. Yes. I were asking you to type. If you can, try to keep yourself on mute just because that'll kind of cut down on the background noise. So like if there's like TV on in the background or there's like cars or there's construction going on around your house or people talking, um, that'll take away from the person who is presenting, which is going to be Charlotte. She's our lead park ranger today and we're going to be joined by um, two others. And I'll let her do their introductions here in a minute. Um, so we do want to hear from you. So if you have questions, even if you think it's a silly question, type it in the chat. We might not be able to get to it right away, but we will, you know, let you know that we heard you, that we saw you, um, and that we will try and get to your question. Got a couple more people coming in the waiting room. Is Jamie here? I didn't see if she came in. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't think so. Okay, so they're mostly alphabetical over here. And because we are asking you to type all of your questions and answers into the chat, we are asking that you do not just chit chat with each other because there were 80 people signed up for this program, which is awesome. We love that. And so far there are 60 of you here. Um, so it'll be really hard to go back and find answers to questions or to find questions that people are asking if there's a lot of chit chat between us. Um, that's not related to the program. So we are going to ask you to do that just for this program. And if you guys need to get up and go get a drink of water, go to the bathroom, feel free to just go. You do not need to ask. Um, this is going to, this is being recorded. So you can go back and watch the recording later. We're going to try and have it posted by tomorrow, probably around lunchtime. Um, and also, of course, you know, always, always, always be patient with us please and be patient with others. Um, be kind and follow the Girl Scout promise and law. Yeah, I think we've got a pretty good amount of people in here. So we are going to, and I'll type this in. Oh, I got a question and I don't know who it was from. Um, I can, so if you guys can't change your name, I did get a message from somebody who can't change their name. Um, all I need you to do is private message me what you would like your name to be and I can change your name for you. Um, so I did get yours. So if you, have a display name that is not yours and you don't know how to change it, message me the name that you would like me to change it to. <laughs> I can do that for you, no problem. And welcome everybody who's not from New Mexico. Again, making sure we've got everybody in here. And in case you missed it, we're doing our welcome question right now and we just went over the norms. And we are gonna go ahead and start with the Girl Scout Promise. Um, do I have anybody who wants to volunteer to lead us in the Girl Scout Promise? <laughs> I saw Victoria's hand first. And then, does anybody want to lead us in the Girl Scout law? Ooh, Malaya. Okay, so go ahead, Victoria, do the promise, and then Malaya, and you can go ahead and unmute for now, obviously. I'll mute myself. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> on my honor, I will try to serve God and my country to help people at all times and to live by the Girl Scout law. Go ahead, Malia. Am I saying that right? Okay. I will do my best. I will do my best. I'm honestly there. To be honest and fair, friendly and helpful, and considerate and caring, and to courageous and strong. Courageous and strong. Responsible. Responsible. For what I say and I do. I say and do. And to. And to. Myself and others. To respect myself and others. Respect. Authority. 
respect authority. Use resources wisely. Use resources live wisely. And make the world, wait, be a sister to every Girl Scout. <laughs> make the world a better place. Make the world a better place. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, ladies. All right. And then real quick, before I hand it over, um, in case you guys don't know who I am, my name is Charlie. I am the camp director and outdoor program manager for the Girl Scouts of New Mexico Trails for our two resident summer camps and other outdoor activities throughout the year. Um, and joining me today to work with y'all and help you earn the 19th Amendment Patch Program with the National Park Services is Charlotte Grapevine. And so I'm going to go ahead and pass it on over to Charlotte to do her introduction and start talking about Pecos. Hi everybody. So my name is Charlotte Graveline and I'm a park ranger at Pecos National Historical Park in Pecos, New Mexico. And this year the National Park Service is commemorating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. The 19th Amendment is what gave women in the United States the right to vote. Um, and I do have a question I'd like you to answer in the chat. Why do you think having the ability to vote in elections is important. As you guys can go ahead and answer that in the chat. I'll type it in again in case anybody missed it. And so while you're answering, um, getting the vote for women having the 19th Amendment passed took a very long time. It actually took decades of activism on the part of both women and men um, to get the vote. And so we do have two national parks in the National Park Service that talk specifically about the um, fight to get the vote for women. And those are Women's Rights National Historical Park in Seneca Falls, New York and then Belmont Paul um, Women's Equality National Monument in Washington, D.C., which was the headquarters of the National Women's Party. Um, so I would encourage you after this to check out both of those sites um, if you're interested in learning more about the fight for women's suffrage. I'm gonna look at some of the answers here. Everyone should have the same rights. People should be included. Everyone's voice should be heard. You should have a say in your government, right? It's very important um, to be able to have a say, especially in our elections, because then you get to help pick leaders um, who hopefully would um, represent your interests in government as well. So that's one of the things the National Park Service is celebrating this year. Um, one of the things we're doing, you may have noticed, I have a pin. It looks like a jail cell door. It looks kind of strange, right? Um, we're allowed to wear these this month to celebrate women's suffrage. Um, these pins are replicas of ones that were actually given out to suffragists who were put in prison for protesting for the right to vote. Um, so when they were in prison, they were actually beaten and force fed as well. So they were forced to eat um, when they tried to go on hunger strikes. And they were given these pins in recognition of that. And so this month, you may see National Park Rangers wearing those across the country um, to recognize that. All right. So I wanna ask another question now, since we're talking about national parks. It's a poll question. Have you ever visited a national park? And so y'all can actually, you should see a poll come up on your screen. Um, and you can pick, yep, we've got lots of answers coming in, awesome. I don't know if you can see the answers, like we, sh I can see the answers in real time. I don't know if you can see them, Charlotte. I can see them. Yeah, oh, that's I, very cool. Yeah, I was like, you should be able to because you're a co-host. <laughs> yeah. Good, so we've got lots of guesses. Yeah, that's awesome. So I mentioned that there's two parks that deal specific with, specifically with the women's suffrage movement. Um, Pecos is not one of them. 
But what we're going to talk about today is how you can find women's history in all national park sites, regardless of whether it's about getting the vote or not. Women have played an important part in our country's history since its very beginning. And so when we talk about Pecos National Historical Park, we're a park in New Mexico that was originally created to tell the story of the Pecos Pueblo people. Um, and they lived here at this Pueblo site starting in the early 1300s. Um, and they lived here into the 1830s. So that's a very long time ago. And we don't know the stories of specific women, but we do know some of the roles that women had in the Pecos community. And so I want to show y'all a picture. And this is an artist's painting of what life at Pecos might have looked like. And I want you to type into the chat box, what do you see women doing in this painting? <clears throat> Yep, so carrying a pot, maybe washing some clothes. I see housework, painting a wall. <laughs> the men are hanging around doing nothing. Building, working. Yep, taking care of kids. Yeah, so it's interesting for most Pueblo societies, um, the roles of women and men were a bit different than they are for us today. So women did participate in the building. Specifically, they were responsible for plastering the walls of the Pueblo usually. So that is what you see them doing there kind of in the background. Um, they also would be responsible for building the roof of the house. Um, and so while they did those specific tasks and men did help with some of the other building of the house, Actually, in Pueblo society, the women ultimately owned the house when it was complete. Um, so in some ways, it was a, um, a female-dominated society, at least when you talk about the home sphere, the domestic sphere. Women also owned the crops once they were harvested, and men could not give any of the food away without their wives' permission. So in that way, women were a very important part of the Pueblo culture. Um, while men did dominate in politics and religion, women definitely ruled in the sphere of the home, even owning the homes, and men would join their wives' families when they got married. Um, and the children would belong to the mother's families versus the father's families. So that's a little bit different than our culture is today. Do y'all have any questions about Pueblo society? And you can type them in the chat box if you do. Um, no, I, no, no, no. Mm -mm. You can go ahead and answer. Um, if you have something else, let us know. Okay. So the Pecos Pueblo is the reason that this became this place became a national park. But over the years, there have been other stories that we tell here. The Santa Fe Trail actually comes through this park. Um, and the Santa Fe Trail was a trail that was active from 1821 into the 1880s. So people are traveling on this trail in wagons and on horses and by cart. Um, a lot of times it was not women traveling on this trail because it was not a trail for settlement like the Oregon Trail. The Santa Fe Trail was a trail for trade. So it was people traveling from Santa Fe to St. Louis or vice versa um, to sell things, to trade goods. Um, but there were a few women who traveled the Santa Fe Trail 
And it's their accounts that really give us a good idea of what life was like to be on the trail. And one of those women actually started traveling the trail when she was seven years old. Her name was Marion Sloan Russell. And I have a picture of her as an adult. And she was actually traveling the trail with her mother who was widowed. So they were making this trail, a single woman and her children. Um, they made the trip up and down the Santa Fe Trail five different times. Um, so I'd like to ask you to fill in uh, in the chat, what do you think some of the hardships of the trail for a child might be? Someone your age. Remember, she started traveling this when she was seven. Walking with short legs. <laughs> yes. Rattlesnakes, yes. Water, right? New Mexico is a desert area. Water can be hard to come by. Hunger, bringing enough food, right? Getting bored, yeah, walking all day. Yeah, so it could be a tough trip. Um, Marion Sloan Russell actually did write a book, or a book was published with her recollections of traveling the trail. Um, and we also have some other women who kept accounts of the trail. One that fits into our suffrage theme is Julia Archibald Holmes. She was from Kansas, and she traveled the Santa Fe Trail with her husband. They were going to the gold fields of Colorado, um, but Julia was a suffragist and she insisted on wearing bloomers for traveling the Santa Fe Trail. Um, and if you don't know what bloomers are, they were an outfit designed by suffragists to allow women more freedom of movement. So you'll see that they have these pants right, under the dress, which I'm sure you can imagine makes it much easier to um, walk the trail, or as Julia ended up doing, summiting Pikes Peak in Colorado. She is actually the first recorded woman um, to get all the way to the top of Pikes Peak in Colorado, which is a mountain over 14,000 feet high. So, and Julia um, would report on her travels on the Santa Fe Trail. She wrote um, articles home to her newspaper in Kansas. And so again, this is a way we have women recording the experience of what it's like to be on the trail so that we know what that's like today. So I wanna ask um, another poll question. Do any of y'all keep a diary or a journal That's one of the ways we can preserve history is by recording our day-to-day -day experiences in a diary or a journal. Awesome. It's about half and half. Very cool. <clears throat> All right. And then yet another thing that our park preserves is a Civil War battlefield. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with the Civil War, it was a war fought in the 1860s between the Northern and Southern states. New Mexico, a lot of the times we don't think of New Mexico playing a role in, in the Civil War, but there was a battle fought out here that's now a part of Pecos National Historical Park. It's called the Battle of Glorieta Pass. And the woman I want to talk about related to this battle is actually the wife of the Union Commander for New Mexico. Um, her name is Louisa Canby. And Louisa was a pretty brave lady. I'm pulling up a picture of her. 
So following the Battle of Glorieta Pass, her husband was the Union commander. She found out that there were a lot of wounded Confederates in the area, so the other side, the enemy soldiers, and she decided that she was going to rally the women of Santa Fe to take care of these wounded soldiers. Um, and there were a lot of people who didn't think that was the right thing to do because they were the enemy, right? These are the people they were fighting. Um, but Louisa said, whether friend or foe, the wounded must be cared for. They are the sons of some dear mother. Um, and helping the soldiers, she even revealed the hidden location of some army supplies that had been hidden by the Union before they left Santa Fe. So I want to ask another poll. Do you think it was right for Louisa to care for the Confederate soldiers, even though they were the enemy? Yes, I'm getting a lot of yeses. <laughs> a lot of people who already know how to be a doctor are probably going to try to go. <laughs> Some knows. That's okay. Everyone's entitled to their opinion. So I think for Louisa, you know, it was a big deal because her husband was the commander of that side, the Union side. And in some ways, she went against maybe what he would have wanted her to do as well. Um, but she was very firm in her convictions, right, that she needed to help these people. Yeah, it would have been a long trip back then. They were bringing people from Pecos to Santa Fe, right, and they would have been bringing the wounded here in wagons. That would have, would have been painful too, all the jolting of the wagons. All right. So that was just a quick history of women's, or history of women at Pecos. Um, the next part of our program is actually going to be a career panel where you're gonna get to talk to some different park rangers about what we do, because not all park rangers have the same job. Um, but before we do that, are there any quick questions about women or the park? If you don't want to type it in. Malaya, are you raising your hand? Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. My question is, is what different jobs do park rangers do? That's a very good question. And so we're going to talk about that in, actually, we can start right now. Um, so first, I just want to say women um, working at the park are still making history. So just a quick picture of archaeologist Jean Pinkley, who in 1965 discovered these foundations she's standing on are of a church built in 1625. Um, so we've had women working in the park for a long time. Are you, uh, talking, are you talking about ruins? What's that? Are you talking about the ruins that had the church were on? Yeah, yeah. So um, today we're gonna talk to um, a couple of my colleagues. There's Jamie, and Jamie, are you on? Mm -hmm. Jamie, they're both here. I made them co-hosts. Oh, awesome. So Jamie is a law enforcement ranger at Pecos. And then there's also Kate, and she's an archaeological technician. Um, so we're each going to talk a little bit about what we do. We're going to share some pictures of our work, and then y'all will get to ask us any questions you have. Um, so I'll start first. So again, my name is Charlotte, and I am a park ranger specializing in education and talking to visitors. Um, so some of the different things I have gotten to do 
in my career, I give tours when people come to the site. So I get to talk to people and I share the story of the park and why it's an important place in American history. Um, I also occasionally get to do that on TV. So this picture, I was on an episode of Mysteries at the Museum uh, when I worked at one of my previous parks. I do education programs, so I go visit schools. And this is a school in Santa Fe I visited. I think it's still only showing the one picture. Oh, okay. With the mural in the back. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> So there's the one where I was on TV, Mysteries at the Museum. And visiting schools, giving oh, programs in yeah, classrooms. Good. Awesome. And so for my job, um, I have a history degree. I was always really interested in studying history and I liked that it was like a story. Um, so it's really great that I get to talk to people. I get to share the stories of history uh, when people come to the park. And then we actually had a couple of questions that got put in the chat um, sure. the previous part. Um, yeah. And so Ruby asked if the women in charge were in charge of everything, what did the men do on a day-to-day -day basis? Emily wants to know what animals there are at your park. Um, and Sarah wanted to know if the women got to hunt as well. Good questions. Um, so first with the men. Um, so the men did uh, govern the Pueblo. So they did a lot of the politics. Um, they were also the hunters. And then men would also do some things that we might consider today to be women's work. Um, so the men were actually the weavers um, and they also did the physical farming. Um, so they would be the ones who planted and harvested the crops. And then when they came in, the women would be the ones to do most of the work preserving those crops um, so that they would have them to eat later. Uh, so women didn't do a lot of hunting. I mean, they may have done some, but it was primarily uh, a duty of the men of the Pueblo. And then for animals, we have lots of animals in the park. Um, the coolest thing recently is one of our staff actually saw a mama bear and two cubs at the park off one of our trails. Um, we also have mountain lions. You don't see them very often. Lots of rattlesnakes. <laughs> so do they have, do you have wolves? Do you have the, what do we have, New Mexican gray wolf? Is that what we have? Yeah, I don't know that we've ever seen them in the park. Um, coyotes, bobcats, lots of lizards. We're especially seeing the lizards right now. <laughs> nice. um, and lots of different kinds of birds, too. And Elizabeth wants to know, how do we know if they really did what you're saying? That's a very good question, right? Because this was a very long time ago. Um, and there's not really a written language for the ancestral Pueblo people. Um, so what we rely on are oral histories. So those are stories that are passed down generation to generation um, within families and within communities. So we do um, work very closely with particularly the Pueblo of Jemez, um, which is where the last Pecos people went to live when they left Pecos Pueblo. Um, and so we've talked to them about what stories have been passed down. We also rely on archeology. span So we have the site, right? And there's still a lot of things here at the site um, that we can get evidence or support for these theories from. Now, the way we interpret what we find is not necessarily always correct, but I'll let Kate talk more about that because that's actually her job. <laughs> Excellent. 
And you guys can keep putting your questions in there. And even if we don't get to them right away, I'll make sure that I'm, because I'm putting them over here in another document so that we can come back to them as well. Okay, cool. I see, where did the Pecos people go and why? Um, so the very last people to leave Pecos Pueblo went to the Pueblo of Jemez, um, which is another Pueblo here in the Santa Fe area. And they went there because those um, two Pueblos are related historically. They speak the same language. Um, and they left because of a variety of reasons. The Pueblo was being raided by other Native American groups like the Comanche at that time. Um, their population had also declined due to disease introduced by the Spanish. Um, and also there were more Spanish people moving into the Pecos Valley who were encroaching on the Pueblo people's space. Why did I become a park ranger? Um, I became a park ranger because I love history and I always wanted to work in a museum or at a historic site. Um, and I just got my first job at a park in Texas giving tours and I loved it. I loved being able to talk to people about the history of the site. I see lots of bunnies. <laughs> <laughs> we had a couple of people asking if you find arrowheads there. Yeah, we do find arrowheads um, and we also find what we call pottery shards, so pieces of broken pottery, um, which are really cool because sometimes they still have paint or glaze on them, so you can see like a part of the pattern they would have painted it with. Cool. Right. Do we want to have uh, Jeannie or Kate introduce themselves? Yeah, uh, let's have Kate go next. There's lots of archaeology questions. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Kate. I'm an archaeologist at Pecos. Um, I've worked there for about four and a half years now and so what my job is, I've got lots of jobs that I do there. So I'm trained as an archaeologist and I work a lot with the prehistoric stuff so that would be the Pueblo um, aspect of history but also the Paleo-Indian and Archaic Indian aspects of of the history of Pecos in our area. But then also we've got a lot of historic buildings that we work with. Um, and that can be a log cabin or it can be mostly adobe structures. So we have a lot of adobe structures. Um, and adobe is basically sun-baked mud. That's all it is. It's really just mud, which is very cool. But it takes a lot to maintain, especially with, I don't know if you can see behind Charlotte there, you can see the church and the convento. They're all made out of adobe and they don't have any roofs on them anymore. <laughs> so when there's a roof on an adobe structure, it's pretty well protected. But when there's not a roof on it anymore, it takes a lot to maintain it because it is just dried mud. And you guys probably know we get some pretty crazy storms out here and we do get plenty of snow. And all of that moisture just kind of eats away at the adobe. So one of my main jobs is maintaining what's behind Charlotte there and keeping it standing so that people like you guys can come and visit and ask all the amazing questions that you guys are asking right now. But also the um, Pueblo. So we, we've got a lot that we maintain and that's, that's a big part of my job and documenting what we do and uh, telling people about the amazing history that we have there at Pecos. Okay. So Kate, what kind of education did you need to have your job? So I just have an undergraduate degree. So I have a four-year degree in anthropology um, with a focus in archaeology. And a lot of people do get a master's for it. I chose to just have experience and work my way up from being an intern. So I started as an, at an internship at Canyon de Chez, which is out in Arizona. Um, and then they ended up hiring me on as a seasonal. And now I'm at Pecos where I got, I got permanent. So I've just kind of worked my way up with my four year degree. 
Cool. And we got a comment. I thought it was dry in New Mexico. <laughs> Common misconception. <laughs> it's dry for a long, long time. But then when it rains, it really rains. And when it snows, it tends to really snow. And the thing about New Mexico is it'll dump a whole bunch of moisture and then it'll get really sunny and warm again. And so everything melts, um, which causes kind of different erosion patterns than, because I'm originally from Minnesota where we get lots and lots and lots of snow, but it sticks around for months and months. Um, and then it all slowly starts melting. Whereas here, we'll get a foot of snow and then it'll melt within a day or two. And so all of that moisture has to go somewhere. And when you're talking about, again, dried mud, it, it really chews up the walls. So yeah, <laughs> common misconception though. <laughs> Do y'all have any questions for Kate on what it's like to be an archaeologist or how you become an archaeologist? I have a question. Yeah. Yes. Um, um, so oh, what was it like to be an internship? An internship? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I had an awful lot to learn. <laughs> Because with internships, that's the whole point of them, is it's to teach you, um, the people that you're working with are supposed to be teaching you and helping you build up your career. But it also means that you have to work really hard to learn the stuff that they're teaching you. But it's pretty, it's pretty fun because usually the interns are the ones who are doing all of the field work and all of the really fun stuff outside and going to all these new sites and you're constantly learning new things and taking in new information. And um, so it's, it's a very exciting time and I would absolutely recommend it for sure because you learn a lot. It's hard, but it's fun. It's really fun. And we also got, what are some of the things you do to maintain the structures? Good question. Um, so especially with the adobe structures, so again with the, the, um, the church and the convento that are behind Charlotte, uh, we basically build, I kind of tell people it's almost like building a little mini house around the original adobe in those walls. Because the original adobe there is from the 16 and 1700s. So it's really, really old dried mud. And if we just left it, um, exposed to the elements, um, it wouldn't be there anymore. It would just be a mound of dirt. So um, what we do is we build, we call it a veneer, but it's basically like a little house that goes around the original adobe. And we bake our own adobe bricks. Um, so we build it out of adobe and we try to mimic what's behind the wall. So if there's a window or a doorway or a built-in shelf or a color change in the adobe, we try to mimic that in the adobe bricks that we make. And we make them right next to where Charlotte is sitting. So when you go to Pecos, you can see um, the area that we bake our own bricks and they're just sun-baked. They're pretty cool. Um, so that's one of the main things that we do to maintain the adobe structures. Um, when it has a roof, it's just kind of making sure, I, I don't know if any of you guys live in a historic or old house, but Old houses creak, they kind of move, they don't really have straight lines, not everything's quite lined up. Um, if there's a, a leak in a pipe, it can be really, really bad. If there's a leak in the roof, it can be extra super bad. And so making sure none of that stuff happens in the historic buildings that we use on a daily basis, um, like the trading post, which was a a stage stop along the Santa Fe Trail or Pigeons Ranch, which was also along the Santa Fe Trail and saw the Civil War. It was a part of the battle that happened in Glorietta Pass during the Civil War. So all of those things, we just kind of have to keep an eye on. And they, when those structures were originally made, they were just using mud mortar, basically. So instead of cement to hold everything together, they just used mud. Um, and so we pack in that same mud mixture uh, to make sure that that mortar doesn't get eroded so that the bricks start falling out and stuff starts crumbling. So it's a full-time job for 
um, a whole crew of preservation workers uh, that are on for about six months every single summer. And they do a fantastic job of keeping everything upright so that everybody can come and visit. And I think one last question before we move on to Jamie. Um, we got, what inspired you to be a park ranger? Oh, um, well, also like Charlotte, I loved history and that what, that's what made me want to be an archeologist. But what made me want to be a park ranger was that the park service preserves and maintains and studies and documents these like the most amazing places in our country. They're the most beautiful, they're the most historically relevant, they're, they're passion driven. I mean, they're, they're the most amazing places in our country. And I really wanted to be a part of maintaining that and preserving them and keeping them standing for generations and generations of people to come um, and learn about the amazing history that we have in this country. Uh, so that's why I became a park ranger. For sure. Awesome. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, guys. <laughs> All right. So next we have Jamie, who is a law enforcement park ranger here at Pecos. Where is he? Good question. <laughs> Jamie, are you in there? Here. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. There you are. Forgive me. I am not great with technology at all. Um, and I'm very new to Zoom. So um, Charlotte actually has some of my photos that I'll be sharing with you guys. Um, but first of all, so I'm a law enforcement ranger with the Park Service. Um, so my sole job, my, my first job um, is to protect um, the people and, um, and the animals and all of the structures in the Park Service. Um, so I am, I like to explain it to people, um, I'm a federal police officer. So you, you guys might know some of your local police officers. A lot of them work for the state or work for the county. I work for the federal government, um, just, like, just like Kate and Charlotte as well. We all work for the federal government. Um, so I enforce federal laws in the park. Um, so if somebody's being naughty, um, they will usually call me and I can deal with the person. <laughs> and um, try to alleviate them from doing what they're doing. Um, a unique part of being law enforcement in the Park Service, um, I'm expected to be um, a firefighter, um, a, um, in some sort of medical services, um, have some sort of medical degree, um, be extend have extensive knowledge in search and rescue, um, and be physically fit. Um, which all of us in the Park Service are physically fit and we can, most, most of the people that work for the Park Service can also do search and rescue, fire, and EMS. Um, but to be hired as a law enforcement ranger in the Park Service, you have to have at least search and rescue experience and medical services. Um, so I am a first responder. Um, I help with a lot of search and rescues as well. I am not yet fire certified. Um, but I will be soon. Um, the Park Service likes two separate types of firefighters, structural fire and wildlife fire. Um, so you can do structural would be like buildings. Um, so Charlotte right now is showing some of my photos. Um, I was in Yellowstone last year, um, working in Pecos this year. Um, the first photo was um, we drove the ambulance. Um, that was me doing one of our medical calls. Um, the photo that's up right now is one of our search and rescues. Um, a woman had um, fallen and hurt her ankle pretty badly at the top of a mountain. So we uh, rushed up there, um, got it all bandaged, and then put her into a, a little cot. And then we have um, 10 to 15 people walking her out. So it was at a very steep incline um, trying to get her out of there. So she's on a cot way in the back. Um, and we're all kind of lifting her down the mountain. Um, another thing with law enforcement in the Park Service, you have to be incredibly physically fit. So all the people in that search and rescue, um, most of them are law enforcement, some of them are, EM, are um, specifically EMS, um, and some of them are interpretation, so just like Charlotte. Um, 
but so on a daily basis, I wear about 30 pounds of gear. So I have my body armor on underneath my shirt and that protects me. And then I also wear my duty belt. Um, and that's, that's about 20 pounds. My belt is about 10 pounds <laughs> or my vest is about 10 pounds. Um, to get into law enforcement, I specifically have a degree in law enforcement. Um, I specialized in wildlife law enforcement. Um, and I also have a degree in wildlife um, emerg emergency medical services. Um, and that all kind of helped me get a job right away out of school. Um, you do also have to go to a police academy to become a, a law enforcement ranger with the park service. Does anybody have any? All right, y'all have any questions? Nope, sorry, or Jamie. <laughs> I have a question. Go ahead. Um, so, so, first, thank you for your service. Thank you. And um, um, how long do you have to go, go to the police academy? Um, so our police academy, the one that I went through, it's about 14 weeks. So you go there, um, you initially, you have to take a physical fitness test, um, and then you do a bunch of schooling. The one that I went to um, is actually, you can get state certified. I'm also from Minnesota, like Kate. Um, so we, I got state certified through Minnesota and federally certified. So the federal certification, there's only six um, schools in the entire country where you can get your federal certification. Um, they're in Colorado, Arizona, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Mi Minnesota, and Washington State. Any other questions? We did get in the chat, what are some situations you've dealt with? Um, good question. Um, so in, in my time in Yellowstone, there were a lot of bad people there. Um, I did a lot of, um, we arrested some people for doing some not so great things like climbing on Old Faithful. I don't know if any of you are, are um, familiar with Yellowstone, but Ye Old Faithful is the largest geyser, uh, definitely the most populated. Um, and that's the district that I worked in. Um, so people would climb on the geysers um, people would drive like crazy. There were a lot of car accidents. Um, we did a lot of, um, a lot of people got heart attacks or heat um, exhaustion. Um, we, there's, there's a lot. Um, if you, if you want to know anything in, in particular, like medical, fire, or um, law enforcement, um, I can elaborate more on, on any of them, but we had, we had a lot of all, all of them. We had a, a lot of calls, including them all. So is there anything you learned in elementary school that helps you do your job now or with getting your job today? Um, in elementary school, I mean, yeah, I think, I think we can all agree that when you work for the Park Service, you kind of have to be creative in your, in your job um, and how you handle people. Um, you have to learn how to be nice to people and speak with them you know with respect because when you when you speak to people with respect they will respect you back I like that one awesome and uh any volcanoes <laughs> <laughs> in yellow um no real volcanoes i mean um the geysers are <laughs> technically um kind of mini volcanoes but those are all safe to be around Ooh. There are sleeping volcanoes on um, on the um, oh, what's it called? The one where it's like a bunch of bunch of little streets. It's I can't remember what it's called, but I always see them. Where you're driving to the airport, I always see them. Sleeping you see volcanoes. volcanoes? Sleeping volcanoes. <laughs> she's from she's from Albuquerque, um, right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm trying to think. I I yeah I'm not sure what you're what you're referring to. Um, it's on. But we do. 
It's on Coors, I think. Oh, sure. here in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm not familiar with ones down in Albuquerque, but we do have another we're park the, here. Uh, three Sleeping Sisters. Oh, yeah. Oh. That's what cool. they're called. Thank you. <laughs> cool. I am not familiar with those, but we do have another park. If you guys are, um, if you've ever been up to the Vice Caldera, the Vice Caldera is actually, it's at the tail end of the super volcano that is in Yellowstone right now. So that was a very large volcano back in the day, and they still have thermal features that you can find that are very similar to the ones in Yellowstone. That's super cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, absolutely. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I oh. know there are still a lot of questions that girls want to ask. So if you guys want to, you can still put them in the chat. Um, but we do only have five minutes left <laughs> of our oh. hour, which is fine. We can go over just a little bit. Um, but I just wanted to introduce, and we can keep asking questions as well, but I just want to go ahead and introduce um, the activity that we have for y'all that will finish out you earning your patch. Um, so what you guys all have here is you have a little printout called Suffrage Cat. And the activity is to color the cat in, and you can color it like a suffragist. So any of the ones that we talked about today, you can color it like a park ranger. You can also color it like just a regular cat. And then you're supposed to cut the cat out, or you don't have to cut it out if that's too hard for you. And then when you go and actually visit the national park, so if you go to Pecos or if you go to one that's closer to where you live, um, then you take the cat with you and then you take a picture with the cat at the national park. And so the cat is a symbol of the suffragist movement um, back all the way in April of 1916. Um, but the suffragists Nell Richardson and Alice Burke started a cross-country road trip to educate people about being a suffragist and why women deserve the right to vote. And they uh, would stop in cities, and while they were doing that, they adopted the cat, which became the symbol of the suffragist movement. So now you have your symbol that you're going to decorate however you want, and you can do that while we're still on um, talking with Jimmy and Kate and Charlotte, um, or you can do it later, but you want to be able to make sure that once we are able to visit our parks in person, which some states already can, so some states you can already go to parks, and you are, Charlotte, you guys are open for day use, right? Yes, we're open. Um, we have an information table set up outside our visitor center that's available from 8.30 to 4 o'clock, and the park is open from 8 to 4.30. Yeah, and then just make sure that if, especially if you're in New Mexico, where we do still have our social distancing and our masks ordered, that if you do go out into a public place, make sure you're wearing a mask and make sure you're maintaining at least six feet of distance between you and other people who are not in your family group. If you're in your family group, you can still stay close to them. Um, but you guys can go ahead and start coloring on your cat if you would like to, you know, give them a face, give them some color on their body, um, and then we can go ahead and, if you guys still have time, we can keep asking and answering questions to the park rangers. Okay. So, oh. Finish your treat. Okay. Sorry. So, I do see a question about how are national parks alike or different from the Forest Service? Um, so, that's really um, an issue of mission. So the National Park Service, we fall under the Department of Interior and the Forest Service is actually part of the Department of Agriculture. Um, so they were created earlier than the Park Service and their main kind of mission from their founding is actually the preservation of trees for use. Um, so it's kind of more like trees as a crop, although in more recent decades, um, recreation, so people hiking, camping, fishing, has become a much bigger part of the Forest Service, but they are still mostly about um, preserving those trees to be used eventually um, as, as lumber or for building material. Um, so the Park Service is much more about preservation, um, saving these places as they are for future generations. Um, but we're also about use. So we are about people coming to visit us as well to see these places and be able to hike and camp and learn the historical stories. Um, did you have How many national parks are there? Currently over 420 National Park Service sites in the country. 
Um, there's at least one in every state, and we also have them in our U.S. territories. So Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, um, those places also have U.S. national parks. Any other questions? I think I saw one before I started talking. I just wanted to make sure we got that out there. Somebody said they thought the Valles Caldera was in New Mexico, not California. And where did it go? I think someone named Mira had a question. And if you guys want to, you can still raise your hand and ask your question out loud. Um, is, is the woman with the ankle and some of your other patients better? Didn't quite hear that. She wanted to know if the lady who hurt her ankle when uh, Jamie was telling the story about doing the search and rescue it, and if any other patients are better now. Um, yes, actually. So that woman um, sent us a letter and she thanked everyone for helping her get out of the park. Um, she's, I presume, is doing a lot better. And if, if you guys have any specific questions about their jobs, or if you want to ask them about the park that they work at, or even more, or even more questions about suffragist movement. Yeah, we'd be happy to answer any of those as well. And I would also like like to say, um, particularly for those of y'all in New Mexico, I know a lot of times um, as a Girl Scout, you do service projects um, and especially for silver and gold awards. Um, so if anyone were ever to be interested in doing something with Pecos, um, I'm happy to talk to you about what kind of project might interest you um, or what ideas you have. And so I did want to share my contact information. Or even just when we can go out and do stuff again. Um, I'm also the person who schedules field trips, outreach, um, anything like that. And we'll I'll make sure to include your information, Charlotte, in um when I send the follow-up email on Monday afternoon. Awesome. So I want everybody to go to Pecos now. And I want everybody to go to Pecos and I want you to take your cats. And that's at my cat's eyes, so I might have Yes, to we'd love to see your cats. <laughs> cool. And I also, if there's anybody who said that they didn't get the cat photo, um, I shared it in a reminder email on Saturday and I also just put it in the chat. You can download that and you guys can share it with your troop also. So you can say like, hey, we did this badge on Sunday and it was really awesome. Um, and here's one of the activities that we did. You can share that with them at your next troop meeting. And then somebody, um, Ruby was asking, what is your favorite part of your job? So I like getting to work with um, school groups because I feel like school groups have so much enthusiasm um, and ask me questions that maybe I've never ever thought of before. Uh, and so they lead me to learning new things, which I always like. <laughs> Very nice. My hey. favorite part of, oh, sorry. No, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> My favorite part of the job is getting to work outside. For me, that was why I wanted to become a park ranger and um, getting to work outside every day. Um, there's nothing to complain about there. I think my favorite part of my job is when I get to find a new site, um, a new archaeological site, because it tells the history of some person who didn't leave any written record of themselves, um, but I get to know that person um, by what they've left behind and tell their story in a different way, which is definitely my favorite part of my job. I see, have you seen a fox? 
I think I have. Not at this park, but in a different park. <laughs> I we had a little patch of baby coyotes at the front of our, um, the entrance to our park this summer. Oh, that was a fun thing to see. Um, and then is Cibola a national forest or a park? It is a national forest here in New Mexico. Um, but we do have 14 National Park Service sites in New Mexico. Um, so we have quite a few here in the state that you can get out and visit. And then uh, Kate, I think this one's for you. Have you ever found dinosaurs? We found not in Pecos, but out at Canyon de Chez, we did find fossils, which were pretty cool, but they were so fragmentary that um, I, I couldn't tell you what they were, but they were definitely fossils that would have been from sometime around the dinosaur age. But archaeologists study um, human history uh, and paleontologists study dinosaurs. So we can hook you up with some paleontologists if you want to know more about dinosaurs, though. <laughs> Very cool. And uh, how many buildings? Kate, you how might build a better answer. <laughs> Um, let me think. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> we've, got, um, we've got about seven buildings that I would consider buildings and not ruins. Um, well, it's probably more than that. More like 12 you consider the little one. But they're, a lot of them are pretty big, um, so they take a lot to maintain. And that's just in our little park. So um, we, we don't have a huge park. Other places like Yosemite and, um, and Grand Canyon and stuff, they have lots and lots and lots of historic structures. In terms of prehistoric structures, goodness, I can't give you a number. It's upwards of 100, <laughs> well upwards of 100. So, um, but most of them, you can still see wall remnants usually. Um, but a lot of times it looks more like a, a rubble mound. So there's stones and it's in a mound. But that represents um, somebody's field house that they were using on a daily basis and cooking and grinding corn and watching their fields, making sure the crows don't eat everything and um, making sure everything stayed watered and everything like that. Awesome. All right, and I see Charlie put in our closing questions. Yeah, I know that there are some people who are asking if they could leave, and you guys are sure. welcome to go. Um, we're just asking if you are leaving, um, please answer the closing question until you get an option. So you can answer either what is your favorite thing that you learned today, or what is a different kind of virtual Girl Scout activity that you'd like to see Girl Scouts do in the fall or in the winter? Finished my Bye. 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 Oh, look, we've got some good cats. Thank you guys for sharing yeah. those. I made and I did see people asking about getting the badge. Bye. Yeah. Um, the badge will be mailed to you. Yes. Make sure that Charlie has your mailing address. Um, and if I don't, I'll be sending y'all an email, so don't worry. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you don't have to come to the park to get the patch. But we do want you to come to the park if you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have the, they made the exception that because it is in the time of COVID, um, you can learn about the park virtually, which is what we did today. And so in the follow-up email that I'll be sending tomorrow, I'll include a little activity log that shows you exactly what activities we did um, to confirm that you did finish your badge, your patch, um, as well as a link to the recording if there's anybody who didn't get to, or if you guys just want to share the recording with somebody that you know. Um, some other additional resources like the ones that Charlotte was talking about at the beginning, also her contact info, um, and then we'll also be, hopefully, if my Adobe program is working properly, we'll have a certificate for you, and then your patch will be mailed to you, and you'll probably get that in about two to three weeks, depending on where you live. Okay. Um, do you have my email? Do you have my... Um... I do. Yeah, because you know my mom very well. I do. <laughs> And then I was going to, I actually have a last final question for our park rangers, if I'm allowed to ask a question. Of course. Um, I wanted to know what is your favorite national park or state park that you've ever been to? That's a tough question. Because um, so many of them are so cool. 
I really loved my, the first park I ever worked at um, was very special to me. It was Lyndon Johnson National Historical Park in Texas. Uh, so it was dedicated to the president um, from the 1960s. And it was a part of his adult ranch. Um, and it was actually maintained as a working cattle ranch. So every day driving into work, there would be baby Hereford cattle everywhere. And um, the river ran through the park. And it was just a very beautiful, historic site. Yeah. That's so cute. So um, I know you wanted to see your cat. So I decided to show you my finished cat. Very nice. Awesome. I think that was Lexi talking. Thank you. Bye. I need to go. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome. Hi. Amy, do you have a favorite park or kitty? I'm going to go to. Yes, thank you. Goodbye. Um, I think my favorite park, I agree with Charlotte. My first park, Yellowstone, has a very special place in my heart. I also worked um, at the headwaters of the Mississippi. It's a little state park in Minnesota. Um, it's called Itasca State Park. That is also very special to me. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi. Do you have a favorite? Um, it's tough. I do love Canning de Chez. Um, Excuse me. It's also the first Excuse park that I worked at. Excuse me. Um, the archaeology there is just amazing. It honestly doesn't get any better than there. There's rock art everywhere. Um, lots of different colors of pictographs sites everywhere um and the navajo people are amazing <laughs> so i really loved working there and canyon de Chez. the canyon itself is gorgeous very nice and then somebody was trying to ask a question but i couldn't see who it was uh um what were the questions that we were supposed to answer before we went oh you had you could pick so your your question was either what was your favorite thing that you learned today? Or, or, and you can answer both if you want to, or what is another kind of virtual Girl Scout program that you would like to see Girl Scouts in general, but not just me, but like all Girl Scouts, uh, do in the fall or the winter? I'm just gonna see what... And Jamie, it looks like someone was asking how long you were at Yellowstone. So I'm a seasonal employee, so I only work six months out of the year. So I was in Yellowstone for six months last year. So from August to September. But I would definitely go back. Very cool. I'm gonna do a quick scroll and make sure we didn't miss anything. Bye. Bye, Victoria. Bye. Yeah. And I think, I think that's really it. So I definitely want to say a big, huge thank you to Charlotte and to Jamie and Kate for being with us today, and Charlotte specifically for working with me to set this up. Uh, I had a great time. I think this was amazing, and I learned so much. Um, and so I hope everybody else had a great time. And like I said, we'll be reaching out to your parents and to you to let you know um, more information about PICOS, but also the 19th Amendment Patch Program. Uh, we hope you had a wonderful time, and we will we'll officially go ahead and sign off and say goodbye, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, it. thank you. And you guys can unmute yourselves to say bye or thank you. <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much. Bye. bye. You're welcome. Bye. 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 Thank bye. you. Bye. So many good bye. coverage paths. Bye. They're really bye. Yeah, that's awesome. Bye. 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 Oh, she got a suffrage sash and everything. Very nice. Oh, look at that. Did their research. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Oh, that awesome, y'all. I only got so far as to do a face, and it's a little crooked. <laughs> <laughs> it has good cat eye. Thanks. <laughs> Ooh, there we go. Got another suffrage uh, sash. sash. Yeah, look at that. Uh, and if there's anybody who does not know how to exit themselves from the room, let me know um, and I can remove you. <gasps> glitter. Oh, somebody put glitter on theirs. Yes. Bye. <laughs> That's awesome. Bye. Oh, that's you, baby.
It has glitter on its nose. <laughs> I love glitter. So do I. I had was markers. I got new glitter, so I put it in these jars. Ooh. <laughs> hey, cool. I read my pink and purple, so I used this pink and the purplish. They kind of look the same for the nose. Very nice. I, That's awesome. I was going to use green for the eyes, but I couldn't find it. <laughs> Malaya, do you know how to remove yourself from the room, or do you need some help? I know. Okay. I can do that. Bye. Bye, Riley. Bye. <laughs> Give me one second.